es la invitación que se le presenta a todos y a los que escuchan para que pueda configurar un escenario propio. Es un género totalmente libre en su construcción. Es un género totalmente libre en su construcción. Radio Art is the invitation that we make to the receiver, the radio listener, Recomendamos el uso de auriculares. Recomendamos el uso de auriculares. You have my permission, but we are recording, and you can use this recording. If you can edit out anything stupid that I say, that would be great <laughs> and make me sound really smart. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. There's, There's no, no such, such thing, thing, by the way. No, just you know. <laughs> All our conversations have been so fruitful and so impressive that sometimes we say, "Gosh, we can't erase, or we can't delete this. We can't delete this." Oh, I'm happy to hear that. Sounds good. My name is Nina Guo, and I am a recently I've been describing myself as an opera singer who got a little bit lost but found an even more fun path for myself. So I studied classical music, which is music that I still very very much uh, enjoy thinking about and listening to and watching performances of. Um, but for the last oh my god, like over ten years, I guess I became really really interested in contemporary music. Um, And that kind of led me into yeah, performing works by living composers and working with composers, bringing their often smaller scale operas to life, operas of different forms. And uh, in the last years, I also started improvising as part of my practice. And that kind of also has like some relationship to sound poetry, which I also enjoy very much. Uh, part of that has also trickled onto radio um, where, and I have a radio show on Kashmir Radio in Berlin called The Entertainment, which basically is my version of, for any Americans, a Prairie Home Companion or Saturday Night Live is a big um, inspiration for me. So basically, sketch comedy, and in the middle, there's a guest who performs a musical set. And I live in Berlin at the moment, and I'm from Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, in this environment, that you describe, what are your sonic searches? Oh my God, that's such a good question. I might have to steal that. That is so good. I think, first of all, I, I love being surprised. I think in general, in things that I listen to or things that I experience in the world, I love that feeling of surprise. And so wherever I kind of get that feeling, I think is really what I'm looking for. It feels a little bit counterintuitive maybe to say that I'm sonically searching for surprise but basically I will always yes and something if someone is like hey do you want to like go to this festival and I don't know anyone's name yes absolutely I definitely want to go because I just have no idea what I'm going to hear or like hey do you want to go 
check out this thing or like sends me an album and I haven't heard of anyone on it, I absolutely want to listen because I have no expectations. And the cliche is true. Truth is stranger than fiction. Truly, the you never know what you will hear. So I think that's what I'm searching for is I'm just always looking for what I haven't heard before. I am both optimistic and keep being proven correct that there is always something new to listen to. So that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I was going to ask you about your radio show, uh-huh. but since that you introduced it, I'll go the other way around. And referring to some of the topics you mentioned, I was wondering about since you perform live and both performing live and recording is part of your process, what are the differences or similarities you appreciate in both? media concerning their, the specific holidays and the communicative platforms they create or they generate because of that particular characteristic. Yeah. So between performing live and recording, recording is definitely the newer of the two things for me. I'm a through and through. I'm a performer. You can ask my family. It's like deeply ingrained in my personality. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't deny it if I wanted to. So in a way, the first thing that I'm going to reach for always when I think about making something is how can I do this live? How can I do this live? How can I do this now? How can I do this with myself? Because turns out there's like so much to know about recording and I am really, really new to it. I know very little. (laughs) So I always want the quickest thing in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think I will always think live. And when I personally record something that I've made, I either want it to sound live or I want it to be something that I could never make live because that's the advantage of recording it for me. Um, So in some of the stuff that I make, I like to, you know, layer my voice on top of itself. I know that that's possible with a looper pedal. I just haven't like learned how to use one yet because again, one step at a time here. (laughs) Like I know that it's in my future, maybe, but you know, who has time for that 10 minute YouTube tutorial? Am I right? Okay, realistically I do, (laughs) but like, (laughs) In terms of recording, yeah, I want it to be something that if I'm like taking the time to do it, that I couldn't do it live. And then in terms of, I guess when I think about like what feels different for those two media for me, I think that like there's sort of, we're at a really, really interesting place right now where we can hear things um, in their exact replication. Um, so I'm thinking about, I, over the weekend, I went to, a, like, I went to, like, a college party. That sounds really creepy, but I promise. Uh, my cousin was playing in a cover band. And I think about cover bands all the time. Because, like, for me, as someone who works with notation often, and, you know, we're kind of thinking about recreating a score, or we're bringing something, we're translating something from, you know, one medium into another. I think a lot about, like, cover bands and how they're listening to recordings, you know, these songs that we all know that are exactly the same right you know unless they do like a remix or something and they're translating them from sound into sound which is not something that we had available at all before recording existed sort of in the process of that as i was listening to this cover band play i kept thinking like what if these songs were in a different key like i know that that sounds insignificant but like as soon as gimme gimme by abba started i was like i'm pretty sure that's the exact key you know, and if like if it was in a different key, that would actually feel really different, even though and it's because all of those keys are like so ingrained in exactly like the way that we listen to them, even though maybe ABBA would if they were doing it live would sing it in a different key. I don't know to any PhD students out there. There's some great research on like, you know, what keys were actually performed live by all of these bands just going to float that if someone else wants to take that, then, you know, like, let me know. <laughs> So I'm kind of answering your, your question indirectly, but I guess for me, when I think about recording and live performance, what I get really excited about is that there's this whole rich, like part of the Venn diagram now where like recording and live have this like interesting overlap that produces sonic things that are kind of neither of them or that are like hybrids or that need recording and that need live performance in order to exist. And so that I find quite exciting yeah that's one of those you grasp like four or five topics at the same time including the one you suggested so generously <laughs> just that it that's because when you are someone who has trouble answering just one question you're like <laughs> you're like <laughs> okay thank you do you feel that you have 
found your song or your own voice to do your work or you are still searching? Well, I feel like I'm at a place now where I have a little bit of both. I guess as a vocalist and as, you know, like, I mean, voice is like, that's it for me, you know? Anyone who's seen me play an instrument and has like felt that like deep sense of cringe knows that like I should really just stick to voice, you know, that like it's fine. And I'm also fine with it staying in my lane that way. So I think for because my instrument and you know all of that is located in my body, you know, or just is is my body, I'm at a point now where like my let's say like my instrument and my practice has kind of like settled in a way so like because I'm 31 I guess like hormonally speaking like all of the like there is kind of a like a settling that happens and so like I'm at that point which is cool because it means that like if there's a sound that I want to make or if there's a something that I want to sing that like my body and I can like pretty much get on the same page about like how to do that And also now that I've been working with my body for so long, I have a pretty, I have a relatively clear understanding of like what feels like possible, what the pushes are. I'm going to borrow some, some terminology actually that I find really useful from BDSM, um, which is hard and soft limits. So I kind of have that sense on my body, which, you know, vocally speaking, what are, what my hard limits are straight up, what not in my wildest dreams, what could happen, you know, and what my soft limits are, which is like, okay, I can like push in that kind of noise sphere or like, you know, that I can do and I can save it for the performance. Um, so in a sense, I do sort of the like, the tech specs of my instrument are now pretty clear. Um, but that being said, I think that there's, I mean, again, I am someone who has what my friends have described as aggressive optimism. And a lot of that is about what the future of music and sound is going to be like. Like, I think it's going to be great. I think it's only ever going up, you know? There's so many more people making music from different parts of the world. You know, there's so much, there is so much more access than there was. I hope that there's even more. Like, I really, you know, feel that way. And so I think that I'm still very much, I don't think that my, like, identity as an artist will ever be settled because I know that there's so much more music and sound coming out of every part of the world. And I also want to take a bite of that apple, you know? And so I don't know what that apple is going to taste like yet, but like, me too, me too. I also want to play, you know? So I think that kind of how I, you know, even though I kind of now feel like, oh, I kind of like know the tech specs, but like, who knows? Maybe one day my, you know, Honda Accord could have like electric fuel cells instead of gas. Who knows? Who knows? It could happen. I want it to happen, you know? And so I'm very much still searching. Um, And part of that is also that at the end of the day, I am someone who I love working with other people. I hope I get to work with other artists and collaborators, you know, until the day I die. Maybe me and my nurse, you know, will be like improvising as I'm taking my last breath or something like that. That would (laughs) would really, (laughs) that, that would make it for me. Because you just don't know who all of the infinite amount of incredible, incredibly creative people are that you might cross paths with and get to work with. And so, and what they're going to bring out of you, what you're going to bring out of them. And I will hopefully never be done with uh, finding people to, to work with in ways that surprise both of us. Wow. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. The first person that talk about the optimism. <laughs> oh my God. I am so optimistic. I love it. I really think about, I don't know, like I think that for a long, there are so many more resources that help us feel less alone right now. Like when I was coming up as like a, you know, like an odd bird singer, I wasn't like, oh, I'm the only one. I was like, no, look, there's like a, a one festival that's happening over there. And like, and that person, like, there's a one thing that I found on YouTube. And like, that's crazy. And like, that's amazing. I'm not the only one. Like, I don't have to reinvent everything for myself or feel like I'm the only one working on the sound. Or when I have questions, there's someone I can ask. And guess what? I can email them. <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm happy about the simple things, you know, like that. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. And they're going to write back. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's great. Chirpo, chirpo.
吃饱，吃饱，吃饱了，吃饱，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱了，吃饱，吃饱了，吃饱。And what you said reminds me of something that Jan Cage talked to Richard Castellanet because the question Franco asked has to do with altruism. And it seems to me, furthermore, during this this century, that Cage said something on the lines of that that was a new a European problem, the problem of, of having your own voice, if truly identifiable, which in the long run you just have for the just for the fact of just being human. Yeah. So he so he insisted that it was a European problem. The question of authorship, the question of the young boys, the question of doing something that nobody else can. All this turn was to ask, why did you choose opera, which seems so serious and so earnest and so uh, conservative? Totally. I'm asking it because I've seen some opera experiments from the 20th century onwards, in mostly in the States, and. There's kind of a relationship. I remember watching something by Phoebe Leger, which was some some sort of an opera with samples and live performance and stills and movies, and it was about something that happened at a McDonald's. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Anything can happen at a McDonald's. <laughs> Tiny displays of that in opera production here in. In Chile and in some place in Latin America, but it's very small, and there's still this this conflict with, with the institution. How, why did you approach opera in the first place? Seems I'm not sure if you've, if by your experience you've, you've tried it and tested that it's not something like that, or you imposed your optimism, <laughs> basal optimism, <laughs> to share with us. I mean, for me, I can remember the the minute that I. Like fell in love with opera. I was in a children's choir when I was young um, because, again, when you're a kid that is really loud, like I am, your parents are like, "Oh my God, please burn off this energy with strangers," and they put you in choir. <laughs> again, great fit though. And this choir was uh, sometimes not hired, but like would participate in opera productions because sometimes in operas you have a children's choir because you do. And so I remember we were doing, we were singing in Carmen which was an LA opera production, but it was kind of, it was just being done as a concert because it was in the summer. And it was my first time. So my first experience with opera was not watching it from the audience, but was being inside the sound of the opera. Like the children's choir was like next to the orchestra and the soloists were in front of us. Um, you know, we were in all the rehearsals. And so I have to say there is nothing crazier than hearing an opera singer up close. I mean, it's insane. A friend of mine who's an opera director, you know, describes being like playing in an orchestra, you know, and hearing an opera singer for the first time and just being like, that is the most metal sound I have heard in my entire life because it's screaming. It's someone 
hollering basically at the top of their lungs, but it's also beautiful. What? You know, it's like beautiful and grotesque and crazy and loud. It's loud. If you stand next to an opera singer and like you've never heard that before, like you better be prepared, you know, because that it's loud and totally unamplified. You know, it's just like air coming out of that person's mouth. As a little like children's choir member, I was like inside the sound and orchestras also loud. Like it's a lot of freaking sound to like when you're inside it, people go deaf, you know, if they're playing in orchestras for a long time, like it's so much sound. And so I just remember like being in this children's choir, I had never heard opera before. It was Carmen, which is a great starter opera because it's got sex and violence and like you recognize the tunes. Oh my God, it's perfect. It's seriously perfect. And it's got like a tarot card reading. You know what I mean? It's just like a 10 out of 10. If you want to like go to your first opera, really, I seriously recommend Carmen. It's so fun. They're screaming, they're stabbing each other. I mean, it's perfect. It's perfect. And so, you know, I was there and I was like, oh my God, this sound, like there's so much sound. These people are like screaming, but it's beautiful. They're being dramatic with each other. They're like, that woman is in like this crazy dress and she's like being, and it was so over the top. It was everything in every direction. It was, you know, it was just the most. (laughs) And I thought that it was, and it was all happening at the same time. That's the other crazy thing about opera is like, it's so much sound. It's so much story and all, all that. And it's like the goal of the thing. It's the most excessive art, live art form that we have, right? Like you, it's not like a movie where you know, like you can go and like play it at other places and it's done. You have to make it every time with those hundreds of people that are involved. And everyone is just trying to do stuff at the same time, which I think is really, really insane and crazy and ambitious. That being said... Yeah, opera, like classical opera is super conservative. I mean, it's not like when I was younger, you know, and I was like singing these opera arias, like working on this, um, working on classical music. At the end of the day, like that music, it's wonderful. It has its expressive effectiveness, but I straight up don't want to sing those words. They don't make sense to me. And like for a lot of other singers, you know, their creativity really gets turned on when they're like interpreting a text or working with, you know, a character who was written in the like 19th century. And, you know, my colleagues are like finding their way into that, you know, to make that character three dimensional. I never got like ding, you know, with that idea. I was like, I don't, the only like classical opera character that I feel very close with is Papagena from the magic flute, who is the bird woman. Perfect. Like that's who I want to be the bird lady because I want to show up covered in feathers Unfortunately, it's not the kind of role that you can just like make a whole career out of. Also, her music is super fun. And so it was like, oh, you know, I like I do love this music. But basically, I just want to do all the roles that are animals, you know, and that's not really a specialty. (laughs) I wish it was, but it's not. (laughs) But again, like recently, I've been thinking about Western classical music and basically, which again, I still find useful because it's, you know, even though that's not the music that I that I work on. It's basically training in acoustics and how to create, you know, how to work together, how to get on the same page and how to feel the same time, but in an acoustic situation. As someone who, like, I love acoustics. I love hearing what instruments do in an acoustic space. I just think it's crazy that, like, strings vibrate and that someone can find the same place on, like, a fingerboard every time. That's bonkers to me. And it's like drugs, you know, like watching someone do that because like, yeah, that's just insane. I will always really, really like, and I find that like, I'm grateful for having studied all of those traditions because they teach you skills about listening that translate to everything. Yeah. But I like basically don't like want to kill myself over some boy on stage because like, (laughs) it's not my story. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's wonderful. We have two minutes. Wow. Walking. My first opera was in Butterfly. Oh, a dramatic one. Oh, yeah. Yes, at my age. Whoa. And my first opera in, in, in this way, <laughs> yeah, when I grew up, was Carmen. It's a hit. Like, it's super fun. And like, yeah. right? I think I am watching a movie. Oh, 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And like, I feel like with Carmen, I like that opera. I think it's really fun. And like so much of the music has been used in other things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. We need a little pause. Um, back in five minutes. Okay. Perfect. El ruido es un mensaje. The rides are going up again. They're going up again because it's the time of year when we run to the gate. And we run to the gate because the rides are going up again. They're going up again. They're going up again. The rides are going up again. It's the time of year when we run to the gate. We run to the gate. We jump on the gate. We jump on the gate. And we watch the rides go up again. They're putting up the rides, the same ones that we know. They're putting up the rides, the ones we recognize. They're putting up the rides again. It's time again. It's time again. They're putting up the rides again. The rides we know. We know. We jump up on the gate. We run up to the fence. This. We grab the cats by their tails. We push them in our hair. We grab time. them. We grab them yet again because it's time again. It's time again. It's time. This. The rides go up again. Go up again. Go up again. The rides go up again time. and we watch them again. We watch them again. We watch them again. This. We watch the rides go up again. We can't believe our eyes. The rides time. are going up again. Up again. Up again. The rides are going up again. This. We can't contain our joy. They're going up again. They're going up again. Time. The same ones that we recognize. 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 The same ones that we recognize from time and time again. They're putting up the rides again. They're putting up the rides again. We can't believe our eyes. The rides are back again. We climb up on the fence. We climb higher than the sky. The rides are going up again. Up again. This. Up again. Up again, up again. We climb the fence so high. Time. We watch the rides go up. We watch the rides go up again. Up again, this. up again, up again, up again. We watch the rides go up again. We watch Time. the rides go up again, up again, up again. We grab the cats by their tails, this. swinging them in the air again, the air again, the air again. We grab them by their Time. tails. We run around the road. We run around the road again, the road again, this. the road again. It's time again, it's time again. The rides again, the rides again, Time. the rides again, the rides again. This. We watch the rides go up again, up again up again, the Time. same as they do, again and again. We know the rides will go again, yes. go again, go again. We watch the rides go up again, time and time, time. again. We watch the rides go up. We watch the rides go up. We watch yes. the rides go up again, up again, up again. We grab the cats by their Time. tails again, 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 again. We run around the road again, again, yes. again, again. We run around the road again. We run around the road again. Time. We run around the road again. We run around the road again. The cats, their tails, their cats, the tails are in our hands again, our hands again, our hands again, our hands again. We swing them through the air again. The 
cats are in the sky again. The cats are in the sky again. We watch them fly. 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 We watch them fly again, 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 again. We're all up in the sky 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 again. Again, 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 again. We're all up in the sky again. We're all up in the sky again. We all are on the rides again. The rides again. The rides again. We're all up on the rides again. The rides again. The rides again. We're all up on the rides again. The rides again. The rides again. The cats, their tails in our hands again. The cats, their tails in our hands again. The cats, their tails in our hands again. Again, 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 again. We're going on the rides 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 again. The rides are going up again. And we 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 are going up again. Our hands are in the sky again. Our hands are in the sky again. Our hands are in the sky again our hands are in the sky again our hands are in the sky again we're grabbing at the sky again we're grabbing at the sky again we're grabbing at the sky again 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 we're grabbing at the sky again my hands are in your hands again my hands are in your hands again it's time 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 again we're grabbing at the sky again we're grabbing at the sky again my hands are in your hands again 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 Again, 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 the rides are going up again. The rides are going up again. Again, 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 again. Qual era la rumore di più? Il rumore è il messaggio. Il rumore è il messaggio. Il rumore è il messaggio. And we're back! Yeah, you're back again! Thank you so much for waiting. Yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> I was concerning what we were talking about before, my first experiences with opera were also cartoons. And it was Carmen. Oh yeah! Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Totally! I feel as though that is like deeply under talked about how like Bugs Bunny really like revitalized Cartoons. Actually, there's a joke from a television show that I really like called 30 Rock, which was like, it's just one of those shows that like was, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's a show that I liked a lot. Was it from the 90s or something? No, it's from the 2000s. It's um, Tina Fey. It's like her, one of her television shows. Yeah. And there's one scene where she and her friend are with this woman who's extremely pretentious. And at some point, this woman's phone rings. Or, no, 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 Tina Fey's phone rings. And it's like, dun, 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 dun. And this super pretentious woman goes, oh, do you like Wagner? And Tina Fey's like, no, that's Bugs Bunny. Kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit. And like, that's it, that's it. Yeah, and I was wondering if, if what I saw was Bugs Bunny 
performing or Tom and Jerry or both. Mm -hmm. But it seems that episodes on both cartoons dealing with karma. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely good. Definitely. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's my cat. <laughs> she Girl and company. just needs a, a starring moment. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. I Let her talk. Here we have got two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lil. Oh, no, don't be down on the whistle. That's gross. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Cats always appear in the better moment. Yeah. I know. They have really great comedic timing. You know, that's like they've they've got that nailed. <laughs> <laughs> Ingrained. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They are a species made for it. <laughs> what do you consider to be the importance of noise and silence in your work? I have to say that... When I think about both of those things, I have to think about John Cage. I mean, there for me, John Cage is really one of those composers that, you know, my life was sort of pre and post Cage. You know, like studying his music, um, study, reading his writings. I, like, I cannot emphasize enough how significant um, John Cage has, has been to the way that I think about sound. Um, so credit where credit is due. I also think that this is unrelated to either noise or silence, but I feel as though it is important in, certainly in contemporary music, to rep our queer icons. And John Cage is our coolest queer icon. So I just want to do a little, that's a shout out to my friend Lucas, who's the one who kind of instilled that idea in me that like, let's rep that a little harder. Okay, so anyway, that's my aside. I guess when I think about, let's think about noise. When I, as a vocalist, when I think about noise, I guess there are a few different ways to think about it. The thing that I am most drawn to when I consider like noise in the world and noise for me is um, what we consider noise when it's coming out of other people's mouths, right? You know, I could talk about like, oh, effects in noise music, right? Which would be unpitched or really um, dense in their kind of overtone spectrum, that kind of thing. And that's not what I mean. I'm really drawn to the idea that when we think about noise, especially in the context of other people, what we're doing is prioritizing who has good ideas and who doesn't, or in another way to put it, who we think is worth listening to and who we do not think is worth listening to. And that idea of noise is something that like, I find very motivating. Uh, I don't want to say that it's rich or it's rich unfortunately it does kind of often reveal disparity uh in the way that we uh, give space to other people i guess in that sense there are a few so one of the things that i i often bring so uh, one of the ways that i address that or that i try to play with that is um often when i improvise one of the sounds that i like to bring is a super valley girl millennial voice oh my god you guys that's so crazy oh my god because that's a voice that okay a if you want to see a bunch of europeans if you want to see their shoulders go all the way up to their ears that's the fastest way to do it it's so great everyone just gets like real tense real fast and also because at the end of the day that's like that voice is considered noise right like because that is the voice of someone who we don't want to listen to that's a sound that we don't want to hear that's a thing that we want to block out that's not a thing right that in a way which for me kind of trickles back to like that person is not considered important enough or that person is not considered worthy of occupying sonic space and this is the plot of legally blonde and yes that is an important movie for me you know <laughs> um but i mean i also feel that way for example, the like representation of various languages in what I would call concert music, right? Or also the representation of where music comes from. Um, for example, one of my projects is a duo with a double bassist, and our project is called Departure Duo. And one of the things that we do, in addition to commissioning repertoire for soprano and double bass, is we chart all of the, the music that exists for that combination, all of the notated music that exists. And... One of the things that I find interesting, because one of the things that we chart is what language everything is in. I find it like both unsurprising, but also like, why is no one talking about this? That a lot of the music that is written for that combination is in Spanish. Duh, Spanish is like one of the most major languages in the world. Um, but considering that in contemporary music, which is still extremely Eurocentric, I see relatively little music performed in Spanish. I have sung, oh, I think I've sung you no know, operas in Spanish. In the States, that's changing, but 
you know, that kind of gives you that moment of like WTF, like why, like is Spanish considered noise? You know what I mean? Like what is, what are the ways that we sort of like hierarchize which languages are, you know, the arts languages and which languages are not the arts languages. So I guess, you know, again, in thinking about noise, there's like the type of people that we prioritize as like having space. There's like languages that we prioritize as having space or not having space or being valid in certain spheres or not certain spheres. And so in a way for me, more than I find it really exciting to like imitate machines that are breaking and like those noises that can come out of my mouth are cool and they're not related to, you know, the sounds that I use when I'm speaking or when I'm singing pitches. What I find very exciting as like ground for thinking about noise is that like you can, as a performer, I can bring other voices or I can say, hey, like Jamaican is a language. I'm going to sing it and I'm going to treat it the same way that I do German because it's a real ass language and like real ass people speak it and I'm going to sing it and like I'm going to do it as serious concert music because like hell yeah, like because I want to put that Sat, like that is not noise you know that is not noise that is that has organization to it in the same way that like yeah I'm gonna bring my like millennial valley girl onto the stage because as soon as everyone cringes kind of makes you think why does that make me cringe right like why do I feel like I don't want to listen to that and then it makes you think about why why is that to then go back to silence I think that the when as much as I like uh, a fourth 33 thank you, John Cage, you know, that, like, there is no such thing as silence. I think that the element of silence that I personally like to play with in my practice is what I think of as very charged silence. As a vocalist, basically, whenever I am not singing, whenever I'm not making sound, I am listening. Like, that is what what I should be doing. <laughs> or, like, that is what I'm trying to do. Um, I like when I can see that people are listening to each other on stage, and I will often, as an improviser or like in other performances, may I will over-dramatize that. So my silence will either be like, right, because I need to listen to something, or it will be a type of loss of words situation. And and I think, but well, part of that is because, frankly, I, I'm still working on that type of like really wonderful improviser patience of just like not making sound, you know, because apparently even when I am being silent, I still have to do some kind of sound or there is a lack of sound that is, that is happening to kind of make that possible. But that is a, that is something that I, that I like very much. And so I think that there's a, a type of, um, I had an improvisation duo um, with someone who was playing tape machines. Um, and so the machines were recording me at the same time. And so sometimes in those performances, for me, silence was like very much a little mermaid, like someone has stolen my voice, you know, kind of situation, which is like, a, you know, which is kind of possible in that setup, or that's how I thought of it at that moment. Or there's a piece by Ligeti called Nouvelles Aventures. It's the second of, it's Aventures and Nouvelles Aventures. So the, in the second one, there's a lot where there are three singers in the piece and there's a lot where the singers need to mime listening to something because like the horn will do like, and everyone has to do like, you know, as if you're trying to catch the resonance. Yeah, those are two types of silence that feel really like active and charged that I like using. And I think that what I like about those is that in those moments or like with those types of charged silences, you can actually draw attention to something else. As a singer, basically, you know, because of the way we're programmed, everyone is usually looking at me. You know, you can't help it. Like we're human. Singer is always going to kind of like we always take the highest priority, which is a very cool position of power to be in. If you knowing that everyone is looking at you, if you're like, what's over there, you know, then everyone will look at that thing, you know? So I like that a lot, that kind of like silence as a way to deflect and look at something else or, or listen to something else. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, those are great questions. Okay. They're like the, it's like, this is the real stuff, you know? <laughs> like, please, someone ask me about silence and noise. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
assessment of women working with boys from different aspects. I was thinking about Meredith Monk on the one hand. My hero. One of many. Yeah. Right. And the other one on Larry Anderson. Yeah. Feel free to elaborate, cross, intertwine, mix up, separate, etc. with the three names. I was trying about some, some other one. Since you mentioned languages, and I was thinking about Rosalia because it seems that Sony Music is trying to pull Rosalia into Anglo-American markets and English-speaking markets, but, but her singing in Spanish, singing in Spain Spanish. So feel free to play with that in whatever manner it is. I guess I can think about, um, well, to me it's not surprising that a lot of the women singing in general is one of those professions, I think kind of like modeling, where there are more women than there are men. Like, that's just, I think anyone who is a singer or has been in singing circles, you know, you just look at, like, you look at the population and you're like, oh, 500 sopranos and, like, 10 baritones. Like, that's just the reality of, like, of the numbers for singers. Um, I don't, like, know the reason for that, <laughs> but I can just tell you that that, that is true. <laughs> I guess given that, it also, like, doesn't surprise me that, like, a lot of the people who are making, you know, a lot of, or rather, I'm unsurprised that those numbers also translate to, like, experimental and contemporary music, right? That, like, if, again, it's a field pretty much dominated by women or where women are the main population, so, like, even though the numbers are smaller for experimental music and composers, I think it's probably still the same ratio, you know, and that's... Yeah, I'm unsurprised by that. I mean, I guess there's an angle here where I think there's a, a fair amount of discussion about, you know, women or like, you know, female identifying artists, you know, kind of doing things that are closer to the body. I don't find that particularly useful at this point because I feel like setting up those binaries that often kind of like screws over all of our great female colleagues who like just work with tech, you know, who are like, not us, you know, like, and we're still doing our stuff over here. But I feel like it, yeah, again, so I don't find that super helpful, but I know that that is something that people kind of talk about. I'm not trying to humble brag, but I did meet Meredith Monk once, <laughs> which was life changing. And we have to tell yeah, 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 yeah. There is like, this was, let me tell you, in Meredith Monk's life, this was such a tiny pixel of moment in time, but it was very meaningful for me. Um, she came to the place where I studied music um, because someone was performing um, some music that first had been arranged for two pianos or something like that, a piano for hands. I don't really remember. And I remember, I was like, wow, we, like, I want to go, you know, I sat there, I was watching, I was like, this is great. And because the you know, school that I went to was really small. I just walked into the green room afterwards and like there was Meredith Monk and she's like petite, you know, and she has her like strands of braids and just looks like she's enlightened, you know, from like being her or whatever. And I like went up to her and I was like, wow, we, you know, like that was so cool. And like, I really like your music and you know, like, I'm also a singer. And she said, I mean, it was really, like, again, it was nothing revelatory, but she was like, oh, wow, like, that's amazing. She's like, I started off as a singer, and, like, I was just, she was like, I didn't train as one, but, like, I just always really liked it, and, like, that's the thing that I could do, you know, like, by myself, and I was just kind of working on the sounds that I wanted to work on, and she just said to me, she's like, just keep doing it. Just keep singing, you know, that, like, just keep going. I think that what I like about that story, and again, this is sort of, maybe this is also partially why 
like everyone has a voice and what I took away from Meredith Monk kind of saying like just keep doing it is like voice is like the one thing like it doesn't cost a dime everyone can do it everyone can make music everyone is valid with it you know and you just gotta like keep going at it and like you know and then you become Meredith Monk. No, I'm just kidding. But like, <laughs> um, and let your hair grow long. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm still waiting, you know. But uh, <laughs> but I think that there's something about again, like not everyone. Again, I'm not saying that everyone on Earth needs to, you know, go out and like take singing lessons or something like that. But I think that there is something really like wonderful and simple about you know like voice like you have one of those too you know like you can also use it to like to find yourself I think that's like when I sort of think about access in music and stuff like that I think that there's part of me that again because I'm really optimistic that's like wow isn't it amazing that like you know we live in a time where regardless of whether you're a professional or an amateur that everyone has relatively the same everyone has kind of similar levels of access to like a DAW, right? Like every, if you're just starting off or if you're a professional, everyone theoretically can get Ableton, right? Like, and it will be the same. It's not that everyone, you know, it's not that you have to get like a shitty starter violin, you know, before you get a better violin or something like that. So like those types of things are different. At the same time, I do think that like, even though there is a lot that is kind of made more even in terms of, access to to resources there's still huge inequalities in actually what is available to to people and that i think is something that i that i don't like i don't like that that's unfair because it limits who i personally might be able to listen to and be surprised by you know so like it limits the diversity of voices that there can be in the world again the one thing <laughs> doesn't cost a dime is voice Right. Like, I mean, you might need to record it or find a way to record yourself and put yourself on the Internet. And that might be difficult or you might find it might be difficult for ways to find for people to find ways to perform. But you do have a voice. Everyone does have a way to make sound. And you can, as Meredith Monk says, just keep doing it. Just keep singing. Just keep at it. And like, really, I think that there is the specificity that is so exciting in like in art and sound and music is basically you know has to do with people embracing how their own voice sounds right like there's a fair amount of like you know oh can i sound like this can i sound like that and then you know just like zappa's daughter who was like i sound like this you know that's nothing is going to be more specific than like your more specific accent or like the way that you shape those words. That's also the best sound, as Zappa had to come and figure out, right? It wasn't like, again, I have to, I think, kind of look up a uh, brutal band leader, right? Like, he's, he's, he's pretty tough on his musicians, right? Like, he's pretty hard to work with. But at the end of the day, right, if, you know, the most successful thing is just what came out of someone's mouth without thinking. Kind of makes you think. <laughs> Maybe you don't have to be mean to people in rehearsal. <laughs> wow, it's extraordinary because while well, you were replying, I was wondering myself, why did I mention Meredith Monk or Lori Anderson? And I have the impression that it has to do with the fact that you mixing up different languages and different genres in order to create, which is a sort of freedom that I feel it's just at stake with all this design you mentioned of the circulation of music, mostly in terms of the music industry. There's four people here living in Berlin. Why Berlin? What happens? What's going on in Berlin that's not going on any, anywhere else? <laughs> so that I, I... Well, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people live in Berlin. So I'm just going to say, compared to the U.S., it's much more affordable to live here. Um, like, I probably could not move back to the U.S. even if I wanted to because I'm poor, you know? I'm a poor musician! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We all are. We all we are, we are poor, poor people with internet connections. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, okay, so this is what someone told me years ago. I haven't looked into this myself. This is kind of my hearsay. That Berlin has more public state funding for the arts than the entire United States put together. That's just the city of Berlin. So I do think that there is a pragmatic, definitely for me, I like living in Berlin, I like it a lot, but also 
there's a kind of basic follow the money principle happening. I know that from some of my colleagues as well. It's kind of not cute to say, you know, actually, well, like the community, nah, nah, nah. it's like, whoa, blah, let's be honest. Like the basic resource that we need in this thing that makes no money is we need money. We need money. That's it. Germany has a lot of it. Germany gives a lot of it. And Germany also is okay giving it to people who are going to spend it, you know, on weird shit. You know, they're like, that sounds good. There's, you know, that includes, there's funds for like, do you just want to half cook and like bake your raw, you know, like idea material? Have some money for that. That's insane. That does not exist in the U.S. Maybe that exists other places, but like there's a lot of money. Um, and part of that, um, I went to a, um, a t- like a conference a few months ago for like, Uh, people who are working in like what's called the free scene. So this would be like not official or like not state theaters, not state houses, but like kind of the freelancer scene of theater and stuff like that. And one of the talks that I went to was about like politics, politics in the free scene, stuff like that. Um, So right now um, there's a, you know, like an uptick in um, the AFD, which is the far right political group in Germany. And one of the things that was said in this talk that everyone like nodded and agreed with was we know that the way to protect democracy and the way to counter the right is through the arts. We know that that's true. And this is an entire room full of people who like advocate for the arts, who give cultural funding, who are like in charge of cultural funding. And everyone was like nodding and agreeing and was like, yes. So that means that if there is a, like an uptick in the right, which is scary, it's scary for everyone in this room. And in, I can't say like in Germany at large, but what I heard here was, we know that we need to put way more money into the arts, that that is how we do it. That is how we fight the right, for lack of a better, for lack of a better term. So I think that it's not really, like, given that I heard that, I was like, well, in Germany, at least in this room, there's a really, really close relationship. And of course, like, the money to back it up, that's important, right? And like, the money, you know, like, it's not a mystery where the money comes from, right? It comes from selling cars, (laughs) you know? So like, do with that information what you will. But that at least some of that money is being really actively dumped back into the cultural sector because because it's seen as like a, a part of life and a part that influences life and a part that is critical for, for life. So yeah, I mean the, the Berlin thing, oh, and also you can get by here with speaking basically no German, so like very easy. It's like stylish to call yourself an expat even though everyone's just like an immigrant, you know? So that's I think kind of a like safety bubble of like like that type of a community. Um, so yeah, affordability, you will make money from your gigs. There will be gigs. That's the other part, right? Like it's not a one time a month contemporary music thing. It's like, no, 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 there's festival every month in a different part of, of the country. Again, like a relatively easy in for immigrants. That has a little asterisk by it. I would say that's probably the easiest in is for definitely for American immigrants because, you know, we own the world. And also for immigrants who speak English and immigrants who are like skinned. Sorry. Not to not to get super dark, but like that is the reality of it. Or that's what I've heard. And also what, you know, friends of mine have experienced. The sub-giants and the white dwarfs. And uh, to the far right we have uh, red dwarfs, we have brown dwarfs. Uh, and, uh, you know, up, 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 high up, up, high up, we have uh, hyper, hyper giants. We have uh, the, the red super giant, uh, yeah, the plain red giant, uh, and uh, so on. And so on, and and so f- so forth. Yeah, hugs. <laughs> Ciao. El ruido es el mensaje. Vamos por más, dice la rana. Escúchame, ¿eh? Esto recién empieza. Ha, ha, ha.